and Brandon from War Cradle Studios where we're going to be talking about the game Mythos. So we're doing this in partnership with Black Hoof Saloon so you'll be able to check this out on Black Hoof Saloon on Indie Invasion Podcast and on the Coastal Con YouTube page. So check it out. Enjoy. Hope you guys learn something and go buy so, some new my, games. Here's a, here's, a, here's a big one that I think is cool. Nobody really touches on the horror genre in yes. skirmish games so much which Mythos really does. So tell us a little bit, just or ramble as long as you would like, about each one of the current factions that's available. Well, that's sort of available for pre-order. I know that the war hosts kind of got dibs on the early stuff. I may or may not have some painted miniatures already on my shelf, and a whole lot more <laughs> that need to be painted. But tell us a little bit about the current factions. Okay, so. I mean, just touching on that, what you said about the horror genre is when, when, you're, when you're making a skirmish game or a war game of any description, it, it, the core is conflict because it's a fight, it's a combat. Sure. So yeah. Horror is quite difficult to, to kind of bring that to the table because you have to, there has to be a conflict and horror can quite often be about the things that aren't seen. The, right. the, fear of the unknown, the, the, the shapes moving in the darkness. And that's difficult to bring to the tabletop. But with Mythos, uh, we've got the Shadow War. So there is, there is a conflict going on between all these right. factions. And the horror is contained within them. So let, let's start with the first two, the Priory and the Hidden Ones. The Priory, the priory are um, the closest thing, I would say, to uh, a, a normal um, faction so uh, <laughs> the hand waggled uh, by brandon says possibly otherwise yeah. um <laughs> you know with the exception of one or sorry two of the characters they're all human right um they might fling around some spells and have some knowledge that's you know the, of the forbidden type and yes they might go insane and yes they they've all got a a bit of a interesting background but um they are you know, they can be seen as the, the men in black of the mythos world. Okay, okay. Although, you know, as a cell of agents, they get their orders from somewhere. Um, Do we and, know you know, where? But, you, well, no. Okay. Don't. They don't. They, you know, they have, a, they have an agent who, who gives them their orders, and um, that doesn't necessarily... Um, uh, that could have, uh, be part of a bigger agenda. And be right. part of a, a larger, greater power and a, a bigger um, uh, storyline going on there. Um, and then you've got the hidden ones, and the hidden ones are like a little family unit from from Dunsmouth. Oh, and that's special! A little family that, unit in the horror yeah, game. That's it's terrifying. Crazy, isn't it? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, the, the the Dunsmouth witch is very protective of her of her babies, uh, the angler and click clack. Um, and they are, you know, they've got, they've got, they're your kind of um, strange um, tentacle people. Um, they're who, they're amazing. The sculpts they're, on those are absolutely amazing. They are my favorite, just just in look. They're they're I love them. They're beautiful. Uh, thanks. Uh, so, uh, and just a word on on the sculpts, um, just to break the flow a little bit, but. Um, obviously, we picked this game up from uh, from Paranoid Miniatures. Right. So, the sculpts for most of the, the characters in the game already existed. However, uh, they were sculpted by freelancers, so there was a slightly different style in a lot of the miniatures, and there were some scale issues where some heads were bigger than others, and arms looked a bit out of place. So. We gone. We went through the entire range, and we resized them, we rescaled them, we added some detail, we changed some details. Um, you know, we made them a little bit easier to produce. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we hope at least that there is now a bit more of a uniformity across the whole of the the range. Um, but yeah, the hidden ones are one of my favourites as well. 
Uh, moving on, we have the wildborn, and the wildborn are witches, it's like a coven of, of witches, and they're strange. Um, how do I how do I explain it? Uh, the wild is a force, uh, a natural force of um, the earth, if you like. It's the power of the earth, and um, they, Dorothy Good and Mercy Good, are the witches who have tapped into that power source. Right. And these two snake familiars, uh, they have Cernos, who's you know a, a spirit of of the wild, of nature, of the earth. An amazing uh, hunk of resin. <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's a big boy. Um, and then you've got um, Lorraine, who's an Uclavy, which is a kind of a centauroid um, creature who comes from the depths of the forests and has joined them. Right. And, you know, they've got their own agenda. They're out doing their own thing. And, of course, they come into conflict with a lot of the others. Uh, we've then got the Custos Crypta, who are ancient Egyptian insectoid creatures who infect um, humans um, to make them their slaves. And so you've got these kind of human cultist slaves who are mind controlled. Um, and uh, again, you've got some, re there's a real different look to those guys. The Crypt Guardian himself is the leader and he's just... He's a beast on the table. He's the most expensive miniature um, in points wise. He's just hard to bring down. He's got loads of loads of spells he can bring to bear. Um, and uh, then you've got all these little crypt grubs who run around and they've got the yeah. mutation mm -hmm. stuff there. The you know, crypt grubs are great too. I love those models. They're just, they're, they're little terrifying pieces of resin on a table. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so they're the first four. Then we've got the Parthachronazon, who are your pure cultists. So Chester Barrowman is your typical cult leader. He's charismatic, influential, well, good upbringing, well educated, um, highly intelligent, and controls all of the cultists in a way that you know very few people on the planet are capable of doing. Um, he also um, shares his body with uh, a demon by the name of Chronazon. And uh, there, there's a, a mechanism in the game where um, you, you flip the cards. Right. So typically if you, if you go insane or if you, if you hit your sanity threshold and you begin to, sanity begins to crumble, you become flipped. And then every turn you're making a roll on the madness table to see you know, what happens. There are some people who can just do that at will, uh, or there are some other people where, um, some characters where that happens through something that occurs in the game. Um, but uh, the, the interesting thing with the path of Chronazon is when, when Chester Barrowman flips, he becomes Chronazon. So he oh, becomes nice. the um, And when he flips, all the cultists flip to the, their regular side. So you've got this whole flip-flop Thing, which gives loads of, of real in-depth tactics to the game and how you play that particular faction. If your cultists are in a good position and they're doing well, you might want to keep Chester Barrowman where he is. But if you want Chester Barrowman to go all out and go Chronazon crazy, um, and Chronazon's got some nasty tricks up his sleeve, you can flip him over and then you, you get a whole different way to play. So that's a really interesting uh, faction in of itself. So um, everything he, you just said came out like this. I have to buy that faction. That's all I heard. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I heard from all of that. Uh, yeah. Um, you see, I get like that with every faction. So uh, yeah, know, I'm, I, I would be ashamed to actually show you my Wild West Exodus collection. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, it's nothing to be ashamed of at all, man. You know, <laughs> it's, it's a lot. Um, and, I, and I can imagine. So that's, that's brilliant. Um, then we've got the um, the uh, Brotherhood of Belial, who are the uh, they're a, they're a, a unit of police officers from Augusta in Maine, um, and they have infected like canthropy, so they're werebats, um, and they're using this power to help them in their fight against crime. Absolutely, they're not being. They're not being controlled and manipulated by Belial himself um, to, uh, you know, to further his own ends whatsoever. They're completely 
you know, on their own, doing their own thing. I don't think, time. I'm not sure I believe that from that <laughs> grin on your face that they're completely <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so they're, they're awesome. And they've got some, again, you've got some real kind of wear back um, characters in there um, and some half transformed characters as well. So That's awesome. Um, yeah, some some real good um, good characters. There's a the one with a Tommy gun. You've got some real 1920 stuff going on there. So it's a good feel to it. And then the last two, which are going to be coming out later this year, are the Silver Benators, who are hunters um, who have to redress the balance of fate. So if something happens, someone escapes their fate and they... They're destined to die a certain way, but they cheat fate. The Silver Venators turn up to put that right. So the doctor who manages to swerve out of the way of another car um, and doesn't die in a, in a car crash, and let's face it, in the 1920s, car crash is going to be pretty fatal. Right. No uh, airbags. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, no seatbelts. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, it, he, he, he manages to survive that and he shouldn't have. And then he goes on to save the lives of hundreds of people. That balance needs to be redressed because that has ripples that then change the, the, the fates of the earth and of the people who live in it. And that's where the Silver Venators will turn up and, um, you know, kind of put things right by killing the doctor so you know that's an example of what the silver venators do and of course they get involved then in what these factions are doing because a lot of the things that happen in the shadow war because of the powers that are now being used wouldn't necessarily have happened ordinarily right and so the silver venators will just turn up in the middle of something and it'll all kick off and they have um they have some interesting hounds with them um, which uh, I can't wait to uh, to reveal those sculpts. So there's some interesting bits there. Then we have the the uh, Adani travellers who are a uh, who are circus folk. They're travelling. Oh. So you've got um, nice. so you you've got a family essentially who's led by Pop Max, um, and he is um, you know he he he's a real good leader, head of the family, you know. He he's he's very much in control of his sons and the you know the, the 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 stuff they get up to when they go from town to town. But they're guided by the fates. His wife um, can see the future, and so they're able to you know guide themselves to where they need to be, and, and you know in order to um, to make sure that they're staying one step ahead of all these people around to get them. So. Um, it's, a, it's, you know, there's some great stuff there. Really good, interesting factions. Well, that last one really hooked me because when I, I have a circus table that I built for Wild West Exodus. That's a uh, horror ooh, nice. circus. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's on the Dark Council page somewhere way back. It was back in 2017. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, Darren saw it. Darren got to play on it. Um, but I'm definitely going to need those models. Thank you very much. My wife's going to appreciate all the extra spending that you're having me do. <laughs> probably not extra, though. I was probably going to do it anyway. Anyway, so faction support. This was something that somebody asked me to ask you guys. What is that going to look like in the future? And that's just kind of a multi-part question here. Is it going to continue to be starter box sets, or are there going to be any individual released models? And is there going to be a two-player starter? Um, there, so f first question is, uh, at the moment, all of our plans are for, for faction boxes because okay. they are much more cost-effective for customers. Yes. Now, if we were to sell those characters individually, you're looking at, I don't know, 18 bucks for, for an individual character, whereas... Right. We can do the whole set for $42, $45, something like that, if my conversion's right. Uh, so, um, so it just means that it's easy to, for people to go, right, that's, I'm just buying this box. Sure. And then, I, you know, it, if we were to do another wave in the future, depending on how popular the game is or, you know, whatever we've got planned, and I'm not saying anything, um, but then they will probably be, a new faction box and therefore you would then have if you played the priory you'd get the second faction box 
and then you can mix and match those characters and, and there's a little bit more of a list build. Uh, the original game of Mythos, when it was released, had no points values. You just played those characters and oh, that was okay. it. There was, no, there was no force building or anything like that. So we've had to do some work to put points values on all of these characters so that actually people have got some options. You know, if they right. want to play a small game and have only, you know, you know, 50 point game, for example, they can do that. But when you get more miniatures and you've got another faction box, you go, let's do 150 points. And you right. can then mix some of those characters from the other faction, from the other faction starter. And uh, that, that gives you a little bit more replayability. Okay. And how about uh, the two player starter? Two player starter. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, That's okay. That, uh, we currently have no plans for a two player starter okay. set, but who knows? If we keep right. getting questions about it, that might be something we do. All right. Well, I'll start spreading the word for people to start asking you then. So we have a two-player starter box because I know something, games, Chris. I know game stores like two-player starter boxes. I know they do. Yeah. Um, the other thing I had was, and this was from Eric, so uh, from Black Hoof Saloon. He wanted to know: Are there going to be any online scenarios like the Badlands one for Wild West Exodus? Yeah, well, we hope so. Absolutely, okay. that's something we've talked about, and we have we have plans to do that. And in fact, it's it's even. It's even easier for Mythos because, you know, all of us here are, are, are fans of the Mythos. Right. So, um, you know, so writing stories and, and doing, you know, I've had some ideas about doing specific faction scenarios where you have Priory versus Parthachronazon. And so there is a specific story about them having to lock down the Parthachronazon and stop them or the Parthachronazon hunt down the Priory for some reason because um, they have a book that Chester wants because he needs, you know, a new ritual to enact in order right. to bring Chronos on more power. And he knows that Professor Lazarus has got the book in his library, but Lazarus doesn't let anyone read it. So he's got to break into the library at the Priory and, and, and get the book. So, you know, you, there are loads of scenarios that we right. can, loads of stories we can tell within that universe. So um, there's there's tons of stuff we can do. Awesome. I'm looking forward to all of it then. So, okay, here's my load. This is my loaded question that I came, that I came up with myself because I just, it was really just a curiosity thing. We had talked a little bit before we started recording about this. What was the reason that you guys opted to keep the rules the same? Were they that good? Um, the, the rules are good. Yeah, it's, it was a solid set of rules. We we have actually made quite a lot of changes to the game, but the feel of the game is um, is is pretty much the same as it was. Okay, so there was just kind of fixed the little broken things and tweaked here and there kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I mean, I. I I'd be hesitant to use the word broken. Because yeah, well, because every game is really broken somewhere. Broken, but there are certain things that we look at in a game. Um, and one of the things is bookkeeping. Mm. So if you have to keep going back to the rule book to find a table to work out all the modifiers for you to hit somebody, that's, you know, who wants to do that? It means that your game's going to go on longer. And right. what we want to try and make is a, is a, a shorter, punchier game that you can play in an hour and a half rather than three hours. So in order to make things super easy, um, we, um, you know, we, we come up with ways to streamline the game. And that's what we did with Mythos. Um, one of the things, and that's what we started to do with Wild West Exodus. But the more we started to streamline it, the more we got these amazing ideas for having the you know, hit points and, you know, having all the, you know, the, the, the bits that we added to it that made it different and unique. Right. Um, so, so yeah, in answer to your question, it, you know, it was a solid rule set. We just went through it, you know, trim the fat and, uh, you know, print out a new rule book. Yeah. Cause I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of little free plug for you. There's the mythos rule book. <laughs> I'm a huge yeah. fan of the little, the small rule book. I love a yeah. hardcover with lots of fluff in it and pictures and all that stuff. But this is what I want to take when I go to play. When I sit down at my desk or, or I'm upstairs sitting on the couch reading a rule book, I want the big old 
hardcover that creaks when it opens, you know, for the whole ambiance. But when I'm playing, I want the little rule book. That's so I love that you guys did that too. Um, and so rules and stat cards are online. I don't know. Is the, is the rule book available online? It is. Yep. Okay. And you guys are going to maintain that like you do with wild west exodus or will there be uh, any printed cards put out? Uh, we probably won't be doing printed cards uh, because um, the cards change quite regularly. You know, one who plays Wild West Exodus will know that, you know, at least once a year there's there's a change or an update that rebalances and tweaks the, the game. So it's like a living rule set that constantly, um, you know, gets updated and we, we take feedback in, we do more play tests. But any game, as you as you add more units in and you add more rules and you you know you try and make the game more interesting for new players and for existing players, you get a bit of a creep, and eventually you need to tighten that back up again and go right. You know this is getting a little bit out of hand, and yeah, this combo we didn't really see that coming when we put that new rule in there, so we have to address that now. And so. You know, as as a game gets bigger and gets wider, and there are more variables within any game that you play within that game, um, you know, there are things you have to address. So, um, so yeah, we keep things online. It just means that people just run off copies whenever they want. I will say that is the part I love to hate because I love cards, and I totally get it. It makes perfect sense to be able to update it. I mean, there's there's not a smarter way to do it. There just isn't. Yeah. But I love the I love a nice printed card. So I love to hate that part, and I hate to love it. And it's just, it's a love hate relationship. That's about what it is with that aspect <laughs> yeah. of it. Um, plus, when I have old duplicates of my cards, I re resurfaced my gaming table with all of my old cards. So oh, nice. I can't do that if I don't have cards. But anyway, that, that, that it's it's brilliant. It's really smart to do it that way because, like you said, being able to update those cards and have somebody instantly have that in their hands is huge. I think it was, it was just a really good idea. Not that, not that my opinion of it matters, but it's my <laughs> show, doggone it, so it matters for a few minutes. <laughs> Say what anyway. I want. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay, so this one was from Adam, who's our buddy over at Invisible Hand Studios. He's a really awesome painter. He does all of Adam's, or I mean, uh, Alan's painting so that Alan can rub it in that all his factions are painted while the rest of ours aren't because uh, we have to paint our own. Uh, and what he wanted to know was how true to Lovecraft is the, the narrative or is it just kind of kind of like Wild West Exodus, you know, you borrow a piece here and you borrow a piece there just to kind of get the flavor uh, of what it is or is it spot on Lovecraftian? No, it, it's definitely inspired by. Um, in fact, there's nothing that I can think of that's in Mythos that is directly from Lovecraft, Lovecraft's work or anything like that. So, you know, it, it's got the feel and the look. You know, we've it, we've created um, uh, Dunsmouth, which is obviously a mix up, a, a mashup of Innsmouth and Dunwich. Right. Um, so it's it's our own place, but it's it's got that feel. So essentially, it's it's like a, um, inspired by the okay. works of Lovecraft, rather than actually directly in the sphere of his works. Gotcha. He also wanted to know: Are you guys Lovecraft fans? And what's your favorite story? If you are, um, I, yeah, definitely. I mean, for me. My background is uh, role playing, Call of Cthulhu, so okay. that's my, you know, that that's my uh, understanding of, of the mythos. I've recently started to um, to read the books, so I'll um, I'll I'll hold far on what my favourite story is for now. Fair enough. Uh, but um, but you know that, um, yes, it's. Um, and da Darren's a big fan of Lovecraft, who's our studio painter, um, and uh, so Stu. So yeah, all, all of us are, are, you know, are into that kind of thing. So we we've got a lot to draw on, a lot of knowledge to uh, to pick up. Awesome. All right. So I got two more questions for you. 
One of them is what's on your paint desk right now? Brandon, you need to jump in on this one too. What's on your paint desk right now, Chris? Or do you just <laughs> drop your stuff on Darren's desk? Because I would probably do that if I worked that closely with him. Come on, Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> me i draw you draw no i drop it on my wife's desk all right she's, <laughs> okay. she's she's far more talented at this than i am uh the last thing she went ahead and she was helping me with was um actually with uh wild west exodus the um she's painting up my union guys lincoln and the rest oh i might have to mute you since you play union you know <laughs> that's too bad that's okay i'll just emote the whole time but no with uh because with um with lincoln and the with lincoln and the others the, um, I, I got I got the idea that you know, like I said she's better at than I am that the um, the the troops that work with Lincoln aren't the standard Union blue like right. these guys aren't really supposed to know that Lincoln is alive so I'm going with the whole kind of brown coat look for all of them they're okay. all part of the Secret Service you know so just to kind of give them a different look but yeah that's what we're working on or she's working on she's working on it for you <laughs> yeah I, I can't I can't take credit. <laughs> you know. I, I'm not even going to unmute Alan on this one because I know he's not painting anything. He's got, <laughs> he's got Adam painting it all. What about you, Chris? I can't tell you, I'm afraid. It's oh, secret. okay, that's fair enough. But it's cool, right? You can at least tell us it's cool. So cool. Okay. okay. <laughs> Do you drop some of your stuff on Darren's desk? Um, he, he hasn't got the time to paint anything for me. Okay. Um, he, you know, if he's if he's not painting stuff for the studio, he's he's doing his own thing. So, and you know, if he's not, he's just not painting. So, um, I, you know, I tried. Um, <laughs> you're wrong, but uh, uh, for me, I I I like the hobby side of the right. of game as much as the actual gaming itself. So it's 50% building and painting for me and thinking about the force and, and, you know, bringing it to life. Um, and the game, the gaming itself, that's great. If I get some games in, that's brilliant. But actually, you know, there are, there are certain games that I've played and I've painted armies for that I've never got round to playing or I don't get to play very much. Um, you know, I, I painted, uh, watches. Um, I painted a load of watches. Um, I got the the um, uh, the Viridian clade. Mm -hmm. I got I got loads of um, uh, of the Chigo, and so I did a real cheesy Chigo list that can just jump around the whole battlefield and uh, of really not really thematic. Um, get, really enjoy painting them, and I've not put them on the table once. So <laughs> it, it, I know that feeling, but um, <laughs> they're still there. They're ready to go. Um, so yeah. One of those so things. I know that feeling all too well of getting everything painted up and you got to set up a table and just look at it because you don't have anybody to play with. So, yeah. all right. Last question for you, at least last official question anyway. Of course, you're jump in and share anything you would like to. But I I'm not the right person you'll have to convince because I play everything. If a book passes in front of my face, I go, oh, look at that new shiny. And I somehow end up with most of the models and then end up painting them. But Convince me to play Mythos. What is it about the game that is going to draw somebody in and, and say, hey, this is a game you should check out because it's cool, because go. Brandon, this is your <laughs> question. If, uh, <laughs> in all fairness, I did tell him I was going to ask this one yesterday, so he should be ready. The, if I went ahead and, you know, I was trying – trying to go ahead and convince someone to play the, um, and I had to personify the game as quickly as possible. I would show them, you know, cause it's one thing we can go, I'm a big time narrative guy. Um, I wouldn't point towards the mechanics or anything like that, but I would point them towards something like the hidden ones, you know, the hidden ones, every single, and Mac, you went ahead and you kind of like hinted at earlier, the, um, where every single, every single model in that set screams like coastal sleepy, Lovecraft fishing village, yeah. you know, and how it, 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 it emphasizes it for me, it personifies the game and kind of like the duality of it, of where you have kind of like the side where, you know, they're, they're freakish mutants, you know, really close to uh really close to the sunken pantheon. And they see that these tentacles or this massive crab that surfaces one day and they feed it fish and things like that, you know, they see it as a blessing, you know, right. um, and at the same time on the other side, they're also kind of like a family unit. You know, Dunsmouth Witch is, is the mother and she cares about all her babies and things like that. 
all her uh, weird freaky babies. <laughs> yeah, because it, if if they're if, if someone walks into the store and they're they're drawn there, do they see that black featureless box? You know, and they see the face of something familiar. You know, and they're drawn to it. The one thing that's gonna is, is, is gonna go ahead and hook them in is you know because they see that Lovecraft appeal. It's right on the cover of the box. Right. You know, and the one and you're gonna want to see more of that. That's what drew you in. For me, the the hidden ones in the priory bring it right in. You know, so and they're the first ones we went ahead and brought out. The um, it's 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 just the 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 look and feel of the game, you know, and not for nothing. The um, compared to um, and I'll I'll answer um, it, whether you're coming into it um, just fresh, you don't play that many minis, or if you're like a War Cradle fan and you play Wild West Exodus, you know, you're looking at a game, you're looking five to seven models, isn't going to take you all day. You know, the rules are easy to learn. You held up the rule book yourself. Yep. The thing is thin. You know, it's something you can go ahead and you can take to play. And the um, skirmish things are, skirmish games are all the, all the rage now. So, you know, solid narrative, solid mechanics. The, um, it's, the, game, the game isn't too, and I think it works to its benefit, isn't too expansive. You can pick up your hidden one faction starter set, slap it on the table. The old game didn't even have point values. Right. You don't have to worry about picking up that, pick up four of the boxes, and you might be ready. Right. You know, it's ready right now. You know, it's, it's virtually out of the box ready. So, right. and I think, I think there's a lot to be said for that. So. Yeah, that's, that's very appealing. And I will say too, the terrain set that you guys put out. Oh, the dock set? Yeah. I couldn't resist that, man. I bought it and the second it got here, I put everything together that day. Oh, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's some folks. I don't know if it was you, but I've seen it there on, on the group where they're, they've already set up the fishing village and they got the, the cobblestone looking street going through it. They've already built like a little kind of like fishing village using the dock set. Oh, it looks absolutely amazing. Yeah, that's probably. Couldn't me. wait to play on something like that. You that know, and then that's it. Come on, you know, that's the, the dock set together with everything else. Oh, yeah. You know, that's it. At that point, sells itself. Yeah, that was probably me. They were, they were, fan. I mean, they're fantastic. And I got to, I got to ask, though, I know that, that technically they're billed as pre-prime, mm -hmm. but those things are pre-painted man i put them together i was like i'm not even painting these bad boys they look great Ain't no they are but they're pre-painted they're pre-painted you're right before before not to cut you off just really quick because you're right before the a lot of the red oak stuff and, and chris will correct me if anything they were pre-primed the um, which is why they had that funky blue color right but now we went ahead especially with rio sonora and with the dunsmith dock set it's all pre-painted you know, no, we're not joking around. We're, we're going to the next level. With oh, I, I, I love that. That's a huge selling point for me. The, I, I was looking at them, as a matter of fact, just this morning, I, I was putting some terrain away. I had run a pulp game last night on a dock, go figure. <laughs> so I, I used all of that terrain. And um, as I was putting away, I was looking at it. I said, I don't even think I have to weather this because the burn marks from the laser where everything connects. It's like, yeah. hey, that's <laughs> it's weathering. A cool effect. That's yeah. perfect weathering right there. Yeah. So. <laughs> Anyway, that, that's all the questions I had for you guys. If you guys have anything you'd like to throw in, please feel free to. Uh, ready, set, go. If you don't, that's okay, too. I mean, right now, um, Mythos, Mythos is available. Like Chris went ahead and mentioned, we're putting out more of the faction sets. Got them all coming out um, every month. We're still moving. Uh, Wildborn is uh, coming out now in May. We just announced it a few days ago. Um, if you can go ahead and get it at your local game store. If you're having trouble finding that or can't get to our store locate or anything like that, on Facebook, my name is Brandon Warcradle. Shoot me a message. I'll go ahead and point you in the right direction. Anything you need. All right. Chris, you got anything? No, I, I think we've covered loads today. I'm really okay. happy with it. Oh, wait, yeah. to go back really quick. You okay. asked the question, Mac, and you said, uh, what was our favorite? Because um, I'm a Lovecraft fan. What was yeah. our favorite story? Yes. The, um, the one I read that I read for the first time was, uh, and at the end, it just gave me that little twinge was uh, Beast in the Cave. Beast um, okay. That one to me, yeah, was was my favorite just because I made me feel right there at the end. So okay. it was predictable, but I, I really enjoyed it. So yeah. All right. Well, Chris, Brandon, thank you so much for taking the time to to be with us on our little tiny independent podcast. We really appreciate it. Uh, everybody Absolutely. that we're with is huge War Cradle fans, so we're happy to help spread the word in any way that we can. And um, I like I said, I just can't thank you enough. So thank you guys very much for joining us with uh, Brandon and Chris and go to the War Cradle website to read up and download the cards and the rule book if you want to check that out. But one of the other things that our group anyway really loves so much about War Cradle is the fact that they would rather you buy it from your local gaming store. So go to your local gaming store, get them to start carrying 
Lost World Exodus, Wild West Exodus, Mythos, <laughs> and whatever else War Cradle decides they want to come out. Oh, Firestorm Armada, which I just got the invite to that group to this morning. Um, all Dystopia. the other, <laughs> what's that? Dystopia Wars. Dystopia yeah, I was about to say that. Yeah, that, that's a big one. <laughs> that's part of the whole thing. But uh, go to your local gaming store to get that and support them, especially now with everybody in quarantine. They could certainly use whatever little bits of help you can. A lot of them are doing online sales and stuff. So again, guys, thank you very much. And we will catch you on the next episode.